Well, that was a, a fantastic talk, and I think right now we can, if it's okay with uh, Dr. Simi, we could open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. Question. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, what you were talking about actually reminds me, um, uh, it was a congressional uh, council on, or committee on foreign relations uh, article that I read from 2011, speaking about Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And it struck me as very interesting because it talks about um, is the Islamic fluorescence that's happening since the collapse of the Soviet Union there. And the entire article was about the danger, the security dangers posed by this because of the fact that people are turning to Islam because the Karimov government and, and right. other governments in the region are so repressive. But, but I think the point that you brought up is a very good one. That we're the ones who are supporting these governments because of you know we need to be able to transport things through Uzbekistan right. and through Kazakhstan into Afghanistan for for the war, and it doesn't it, it showed absolutely no uh, cognizance of the fact that rather than seeing the the fact that people are turning toward Islam as simply a security problem that that if we really want to promote democracy which is one thing that this this foreign relations things said that we really wanted to do, it's it's not seeing Islam in any way as, as something that could actually result in, in the democracy that we say that, that we want in the Middle East, right. or sorry, in Central Asia. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, one of the problems that I have um, in that narrative where the turn to, to Islam in Central Asia is a security problem, it presupposes that there's only one form of Islam and it's exactly. a radical jihadi violent form. Sure. It also ignores the fact that, look, um, in the case of Central Asia in particular, because of the hegemony of the Soviet Union and the impressive nature of the Soviet state, that in the aftermath of the demise of that uh, political system, that people are rediscovering a religious heritage that was denied to them. Sure. And it also ignores the fact that, look, in every society that you think about in the world, there is a certain political culture that exists. In the case of Central Asia, there's a history and a tradition of Islam. You can't wish it away. Um, um, and so I've argued uh, in some of my work that actually um, religion, contrary to what is often believed and thought about, is not, is not actually, is not necessarily inevitably the problem, but in many ways, religion properly interpreted and understood can actually be the solution to many of the developmental problems in many of these um, societies that are struggling with democracy and development. And I think for a lot of people, the fact that, that Muslim groups that are arising now don't look like the Jadids did in 1917 or something yeah. frightens people because you know the Jadids to, to, to Western eyes look very comfortable and very familiar and they're yeah. speaking a, in a discourse that makes sense to us. Yeah. But they're gone and I don't think people have quite caught up to the fact that we need to yeah. be dealing with what, what, what's there now. And then the point that you mentioned, I mean, you can't understand or appreciate or objectively talk about the rise of even militant Islamist groups or religious based groups without incorporating into your analysis the very destructive and predatory role that the existing state apparatus has performed, particularly in the case of Uzbekistan, where Karimov is one of the most you know extreme you know thugs on the planet. He often gets ignored, but if you actually look at his behavior, and I'm suspecting that you're familiar with it, it's actually quite brutal. And he's produced a reaction. Right. He's produced a consequence. So you can't simply look at these things in isolation. You have to look at it in a in a holistic manner. Yeah. I'm curious, what relationship do you think we produced? Yeah, good question. Um, um, what well, the longer the conflict plays out, the longer this war continues, the more Syria is going to be a magnet for drawing in a lot of radical religious uh, tendencies, as we're seeing happening right now. I mean, Hillary Clinton just. I think yesterday made a statement about the Syrian opposition needs to change itself. There's too many radical jihadi elements. So the longer this process drags out, the more I think that instability in war um, um, works to the benefit of more socially conservative and radical interpretations of Islam. Instability and chaos tend to do that. Um, now, the key developing context for the future of Syria and the relationship between Islam and democracy is the backdrop of 41 years of secular, Ba'athist, authoritarian rule. There's a very strong Muslim identity, Muslim Brotherhood presence that has emerged in Syria for many of the same reasons as it emerged in Egypt and other countries. 
These are opposition movements that are recoiling, rejecting the authoritarian policies of the post-colonial state. So there's going to be a deep, I suspect that if we ever get to the point where there's a free and fair election in Egypt, uh, in, in Syria, the Muslim-based parties, particularly the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, as we saw in Egypt and Tunisia, will do quite well. The question will be whether other more radical elements, Salafi elements, deeply ultra-conservative neo-Wahhabi elements will also do well. And we saw that trend happening in Egypt when surprising shock to everyone, you have the first parliamentary elections after the demise of Mubarak, and lo and behold, 25% of the vote is won by this Salafi Nur party that really wants to turn Egypt into, um, or, or has Saudi Arabia's model for the future of Egypt. I suspect that if you get to a vote in, 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 in Syria, you're gonna have a similar element of a deeply, um, uh, a deeply ultra-conservative movement that is very antagonistic toward electoral politics and democracy and playing, the rule, playing by the rules of the game. So I think Syria has a long way to go. I mean, these are inevitably gonna be some of the huge challenges that Syria is gonna to have to face on its path toward democracy. But first and foremost, before we can even have, I think, that seri serious conversation about the future of Islam and democracy in Syri Syria, we have to think about and consider and, and look at the, the more existential pressing question that Syria is facing right now. And that's the persistence of the Assad regime and its brutality against its own population. And I think the longer that continues, the longer it's going to create an environment that is not conducive, as I said, to more moderate forces emerging, but it will play into the hands of more radical elements. Um, so the prognosis, at least in the short term, does not look good. The hope is that if Syria can make a transition, then it'll start the process that Egypt has started, that Tunisia has started, that Libya has started. And as we all know, it's very shaky, it's very unstable. It's going to take a long way before you know we can get to anywhere where we can celebrate that democracy has been consolidated. But I mean, that's how I see these things playing out. You know, um, it's wrong to think that in the aftermath of an election in Syria that you're going to have secular liberal forces that are going to come to the fore. They're not. They've been crushed. They've been crushed by the Assad regime. Um, they certainly have not benefited from this environment of war and chaos. So um, the road is, is very long indeed, and it's going to be longer the more this, 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 this uh, horrific conflict in Syria drags itself out. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about Turkey. Does Turkey have any role in the way um, Arabs think about the way they'd like to see a democratic state um, combined with Islam. Yeah. That's been one of the big debates in the Arab Spring, how Turkey has emerged, particularly the Ak Party in Turkey, has emerged as really the model that religious-based forces in the Arab world are actually looking to emulate. And that's just something new, because historically speaking, in terms of the Middle East, Turkey, after the founding of the modern republic, really removed itself from its historic interaction with the Arab world. It, it oriented itself toward Europe. But now, as Europe shuts the door, uh, it doesn't seem like the European Union is going to allow Turkey, and Turkey has um, you know, readjusted its political orientation. It's now um, acting as a model. It's acting as a model in ways that recently Arab uh, societies have sort of looked toward Turkey as a model. And it's, it looks at Turkey as a model for several reasons. One, because um, you have a religious-based government in power that comes out of the same Sunni, Sunni, comes out of the same Sunni political Islamist tradition, and that is been democratically elected, it's respected on the global stage, and it has a thriving economy. This is a model for Arabs that say that, look, you know, we can be religious, we can also be modern. We can be respected by the world. Now, of course, Turkey is far from being a perfect democracy, but at least it does have elections. Representatives of the people are empowered. And also the reason why Turkey, and this has gotten lost in the analysis here in the United States, one of the main reasons why Turkey has all of a sudden emerged as a model for the Arab world is because the government of Turkey has has connected itself and has been very vocal in tapping into the key identity issue for the contemporary Arab world, and that's the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, um, Erdogan has been very, because of the, 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 the Mavi Marmara incident, because of the rupturing in relations, because of speaking out over the plight of the uh, Palestinians in Gaza, this has made Erdogan as sort of the hero of the Arab world. And when he went to Egypt about a year ago, he was, um, of course, um, uh, hailed as a hero. And people came out, thousands of them, they were supporting him, many of the Muslim Brotherhood supporters. But then something interesting happened, and this tells you why perhaps Turkey might not be the model that many Arabs think it could be. So Erdogan comes to Egypt about um, six or seven months ago, um, about a year ago, and um, he's you know, given a hero's welcome. He comes on television, he's interviewed on the equivalent of what we would consider here to be the Oprah Winfrey show, and everyone's watching, and he's giving this interview, and someone asks him, what do you think about secularism? And he coming from a Turkish perspective, says it's a wonderful thing. We think the Egyptians should become secular like we are secular in Turkey. 
and immediately there is a negative reaction in Egypt. And immediately the people who were praising him the day before develop a different narrative. Who are you to say these things? Why are you meddling in our internal affairs? A decided cooling of the enthusiasm toward um, Erdogan and Turkey. And that's because, and this is where I think the limits of the Turkish example uh, exist with respect to the Arab world. Turkey's history of political development in the 20th century, its relationship to modernity, broadly speaking, has been very different than it has in the Arab world. Um, um, the interpretation of religious texts, the role of Sufi groups, the, um, um, the, the, um, the economic base of the underpinnings of Turkey in relation to the Arab world, very different. And so you can't simply, it's easy to say that we want to emulate Turkey, but you know, Turkey is a very different society and has developed very differently over the last 70, 80 years than the Arab world has. So, but I think on a positive note, it is a positive sign in development that religious-based groups are looking to Turkey as a model. I think that is a good model for countries that are transiting out of an authoritarian period to emulate. Um, but I don't think they can just emulate it by saying that we want to reproduce um, what exists in Turkey because the social, structural factors that have led to Turkey's political development are very different than the Arab world's. Um, I'm going to make more of an opinion statement and then leave yeah. the question. Uh, starting with the Turkish example, um, some people argue that what's happening within Turkish politics is uh, it's more and more resemblance to American politics in the sense that you have a, uh, a growing divide between religious, conservative segments of the society yeah. who try to get down to people. You know, hold on to the power versus more liberal um, and, and, and the secular, and sometimes extreme secular segments of the society. And Erdogan has been facing a lot of challenges in, right. in, in, in Turkey himself. And I personally always thought that the advantage of American democracy is uh, the division of the uh, popular vote among the two party system right. and, and, the, and the beautiful balance yeah. of close to 50% roughly among those um, people, and right. that they can battle it out for undecided voters, which is a tradition and, and a system you do not have in most of the Middle East right. or Islamic countries. Right. So when you open the doors and give the you know, democratic uh, rules of the tradition, yeah. uh, this balancing out of the religious conservative segments with the alternatives do not play out the way we see it play it out here. Is there, maybe do you agree or not, yeah. and is there, any hope, and I apologize, I missed the first part of the talk, so you yeah. talked about that, yeah. I completely... No, I agree. I agree with you. That's, that's actually a very good point. One of the challenges for the future consolidation of democracy in Turkey, from my perspective, is there needs to... We need to see a development of another democratic party in Turkey, an opposition party that can pose a challenge and a rival to the Yaka party. We don't really have that. The only option that we have is this former Republican party, and these... Um, for lack of a better term, these people are so ideologically secular and their commitment to democracy is very shaky and they were on the streets a few years ago calling for the military to come in and overthrow the electoral process. There's no viable, credible, alternative party that is serious about democracy and that can push the AK party because now if you're following what's happening in Turkey, Erdogan and his party, they've been in power for three successive elections and they're starting to behave in a very authoritarian way, particularly with respect to um, criticism that's come toward them, arresting journalists, of course justifying it in the sense that they were trying to prevent another military coup. But in order for, I think, democracy to sustain itself, you have to have challenges and, 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 and a series of alternative rivals. A lot of people voted for the AK party because there really was no other alternative. The other alternative was an extreme secular party. There were there was some Kurdish parties, but there was no credible alternative. So they got 40, 47 or 49 percent of the vote in the last election. So that's one of the challenges for future the future progress and, and consolidation of democracy in Turkey. There has to be a another alternative that can force the AK party to moderate its views, to be more democratic, that can hold it accountable, and it can provide a credible alternative to the Turkish uh, electorate where it can then perform, in, uh, Turkish democracy then can start to behave in ways that you describe in terms of how American democracy um, behaves. Although I do want to say on the side note that I don't think the United States and the two-party system here is a democratic example that I would really want to uh, promote because I'm going to do that you need a third party here as well uh, for many of the similar reasons, but that's a separate debate. Yeah. Oh, um, may I ask what, what do you think about the uh, role of religion in the Gulf countries? They have different kind of uh, religion interpretation that 
Syria or yeah. uh, Egypt, Tunisia? Well, I mean, the Gulf countries, anytime you try to make a comparison between the Gulf countries in the context of a discussion of the larger Arab Islamic world, you have to point out that these countries in the Gulf, Qatar, Emirates, Kuwait, you know, Bahrain, etc., these are um, very non representative of the entire Arab Islamic world. They're very small countries, they're very rich countries. <laughs> Um, they're also, religiously speaking, very socially conservative countries, very much influenced by a socially conservative sort of neo-Wahhabi interpretation of Islam. Um, um, but there are also countries that in some countries more than less, in Qatar for example, where they are trying to open up to the West. You have this case of Qatar where you have this progressive king and his family who've turned Qatar into sort of like a mini um, cosmopolitan environment where you have different universities, American universities, a cultural scene. A lot of people show up there. Or, you know, they have um, they have a lot of you know um, cultural and sports exhibits. And so, you know, these countries are trying to modernize, but they're trying to modernize in a very quick way in the context of a very socially conservative environment. So you're seeing a lot of tensions. You're seeing a lot of I think problems, but you're also seeing things happening that are very difficult to generalize and apply to Syria or to the rest of the Arab world because, you know, they're, they're very affluent societies and they're very non-representative in that sense. So the ideological religious sort of component of these societies is not that different from or has parallels to Saudi Arabia. Socially conservative, very sort of, you know, um, restrictive in terms of the public role that women can play. But there are also countries that we should also remember are still decidedly non-democratic. They're repressive. We saw in the case of Bahrain, when pro-democracy protests emerged, Saudi Arabia sent the message, this is a red line, they sent troops there to crush the pro-democracy movement. We will not tolerate, and there's been a major crackdown in the Gulf over the last year. Um, anyone who's suggested, any, any sort of, the internet bloggers, the sort of student activists, uh, there's been a lot of arrests and crackdown, even in liberal Qatar, where as we speak right now, there was this poet who wrote a poem, simply a poem, that was deemed to be critical of the ruling state. He's been arrested and put in jail. And so these countries are not willing to tolerate any political dissent. So, um, you know, they're fascinating societies to, to travel to and, to and to analyze, but the point that I think students should keep in mind is one has to be cognizant of the fact that economically speaking, and politically speaking, and also religiously speaking, they are very non-representative of the entire Arab world. So one can't really generalize in that case. Kind of in that same comparative note, how would you portray the challenges and opportunities for Islam and democracy in non-Arab Muslim societies such as Malaysia, Indonesia, where yeah. the vast majority of yeah. population? Well, in many ways, if you look at the statistics, like for political scientists, there's this, there's this um, um, independent sort of, um, sort of independent sort of um, um, uh, research think tank that annually called Freedom House that annually publishes a ranking of all countries around the world and measures them in terms of democratic development, political rights and civil rights. And if you look at the annual statistics, the uh, one country that gets the highest scores that's a Muslim majority society annually is Indonesia, which challenges the notion and the claim that Islam and democracy are incompatible because you have, and it's only been about 10 years since there's been a democratic transition from authoritarianism, Indonesia does have for better or for worse, um, you know, a, an emerging democracy that looks not bad from developing world standards. Malaysia as well, but you still have an old authoritarian entrenched political system there, and you still have a lot of corruption and nepotism that is associated with the politics of many developing societies. In many ways, I think those societies do have an advantage over the Arab-speaking part of the world. Because of their geographic location, they are less caught up in the politics of the emotionally charged Israel-Palestine question, and they're less caught up in the politics of intervention of great powers that have shaped and warped and distorted the politics of the Middle East Arab Islamic societies that produces all these intervening variables um, that distorts their political trajectory and makes the consolidation and the development of democracy much more difficult. They're on the periphery of the Islamic world. Um, um, some of them have vibrant economies. And you see that in the changing global environment after the post-Cold War, these societies were able to um, make fairly rapid tr transitions to democracy. Not perfect, not ideal, but I think basically headed in the right direction with a lot of work still to be done. So in many ways, you know, um, um, the prospects look fairly good you know, for democracy in those countries. I should mention, just on a side note, when I mentioned the Freedom House rankings when it comes to Muslim societies and democracy, the actual highest rankings that are achieved by Muslim-majority societies is not in Indonesia. They're actually in Mali and in Niger. 
but nobody cares about the societies because they're in Africa. But okay. there, would, there would be interesting case studies to analyze in the context of an Islamic democracy because they are Muslim majority societies and they get very high rankings. Yeah, Senegal and I was thinking Senegal as well. Thinking yeah. about West Africa, right? In that sense. Thanks. Yes, at the back. Uh, do you think democracy is more of a chance to survive in countries where it happens spontaneously through the Arab Spring as compared to uh, states that were more pushed towards it through neoconservatives and Western powers? Um, yes and no. I mean, the obvious point here is that if democracy in, and the transition to a new political order is to be legitimate within the eyes of a political community, it has to be perceived of ha having domestic organic roots, not being imposed from the outside, coming from the bottom up, as we've seen in Tunisia, as we've seen in Egypt. But then you do have these exceptional cases, and they're very relevant in the case of the Arab world. I know many of my friends on the political left don't like what I'm about to say, but you can't ignore the fact that had it not been for NATO intervention in Libya, Gaddafi would still be in power. Um, and Libya is no, by no means a perfect sort of uh, model for democracy. I uh, just reading on the internet today that the a group of militiamen stormed into the Libyan parliament today with their guns because they didn't like the composition of the new cabinet. It's going to be a very chaotic situation, but the reality is, is that had it not been for external intervention in the case of the Libyan uprising, you know, um, uh, we would need, there would, there would not even be a parliament in Libya. Um, so I think there are these exceptional cases. You know, I'd also put into that category, there's an exceptional case with respect to Syria right now. The balance of the forces on the ground are such that the Syrian regime cannot be defeated by the rebels. They have too much hardware, too much support coming from Iran and, and Russia. But there has to be some tipping of that balance, and that might necessitate some external intervention. Although not boots on the ground, I think some sort of no-fly zone would perhaps make an important, um, uh, play a positive role. But having said that, I think those are the exceptional cases. If you look at the case of Iraq, the U.S. intervention and the consequences, I don't think anyone would point to Iraq today that the neoconservative sort of intervention in 2003 has produced a democracy in Iraq. What it has produced is a lot of chaos, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of social division. Now, 20 years from now, we might be having this conversation. We may have a different conclusion if the society consolidates itself. But if you just look and you follow the news, and it just shocks me today, and I'm always trying to be aware of this, that every day, seemingly, there is a news report, it's at the bottom of the newspaper, it's on page 17, where another bomb explodes in Iraq, 20 people are killed. It's just a normal occurrence. And it's a consequence of the failed, I think, intervention in Iraq by the United States, how badly the post-Saddam period was mismanaged. That's a big part of the story. The other big part of the story, and it's important to emphasize, it's also, the chaos in Iraq is also a byproduct of 30 to 40 years of political tyranny of the Ba'athist party that ruined that society. And unfortunately, the American intervention just complicated and I think sort of pushed it in the wrong direction. So generally speaking, yes, those external interventions, as was done on the Iraq model, are not ones that I would want to sort of see reproduced. But, you know, there might be unique cases, particularly when democratic forces in those countries are calling for help from the West, saying if there's not some sort of external support. And what they're all saying is no one wants boots on the ground, no one wants an American military or foreign military occupation in these societies, because these societies have been shaped in terms of their political identity, in terms of rejection of the legacy of Western imperialism. No one wants to see that. But there might be those unique cases during moments of struggle, as we saw in Libya, where if it's not for some sort of external support, the democratic revolutions will be ruthlessly crushed by existing authoritarian regimes. So in those unique cases, I would make an exception. Well, it looks like if there's a, uh, we can probably take one more question. If anybody has uh, another question. I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> so when you talk about religious resources for the, for helping yeah. democracy grow, yeah. and you talk specifically about the sort of the, the ulama system of of holding the rulers in check yeah. and, and forming a sort of stability, which is a system that really doesn't exist anymore, what sort of resources, religious resources, do you see now that will be able to help the growth of democracy? Well, I mean, one of the challenges, I think, for Muslim societies is to um, provide, is to promote societies that are open, that are plural, that have active civil societies, that have free presses, that have an open public sphere, so people can be exposed to different interpretations of Islam. It's a deeply 
um, corruptive and corrosive for the democratic prospects for the societies if the only interpretation of Islam that they're being exposed to is a neo-Wahhabi interpretation coming out of some satellite television station that's funded by Saudi Arabia, which has received Egypt. People have to be exposed to different interpretations of Islam, and, and Muslims have to be um, given and taught the opportunity that you can still be a active, modern citizen of a democracy, participate in politics, and be a pious and practicing Muslim at the same time. That you don't need to sign on to a particular political agenda that is narrow, that is sort of reactionary in order to maintain your religious identity. That uh, That's often sort of a choice that, that has existed in many of these societies. So part of the religious resources, I think, is really to promote these open interpretations and these debates and, and public spheres and civil societies where these type of debates can take place. And I think the more you do that, the more you'll see people gravitating to more, I think, the more choices they have, the more you'll see, I think, a range of debates taking place. Um, and the more, I think, um, you'll see people signing on to and approaching interpretations of religion that are more democratically enhancing. Um, you know, the debate on Islam and democracy is, it's fairly new. If you look back, the major sort of theoretical discussions on it really go back to the 1980s. And there's only so much theorizing that you can do. Democracy, I think, has to be a lived practice. And I think you've seen today, at least in terms of Tunisia, where the Ennahda party, I think, is providing a fairly good example for how Islamist-based parties can participate in a electoral process in a way that both respects minority rights, respects the process of democracy, can respect international norms. Um, and so, in many ways, I think the Tunisian example can perhaps be an example for the rest of the Arab world. Um, um, and if you look at the Tunisian example, you'll see that the leaders of the Tunisian sort of Islamist party have undergone their own intellectual revolution by virtue of really the experience of living under an authoritarian regime, living in exile, um, looking at the failure of the Iranian revolutionary example, looking at the model of Turkey, and realizing that that's the only, um, that's the only game in town um, um, in terms of how societies can progress and, and modernize. So there's a lot of internal reform, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of study that needs to be done really at the local level. Who are the local sort of imams giving the Friday Juma khutbahs? What are they saying to their constituencies? To what extent are those um, speeches and are those sermons sort of conducive to democracy, conducive to promoting sort of equality of citizen rights, and, and to what extent are they not? I think that's a big part of the um, struggle in terms of promoting and developing resources that, that can promote the process of democratization in the region. Yeah, the Ulama in Egypt right now are such an interesting example. Yeah, and though there's a lot of interesting stuff. Al Hazar sort of, I don't know if you're familiar with this document that Al Hazar yeah, yeah. produced recently sure. that's tried to sort of, I mean, it hasn't gotten the attention that it, uh, it deserves. I was speaking with one legion, leading Egyptian Islamic scholar, and he was saying that the Al Hazar sort of advocates of that were actually quite saddened that their document calling for a democratic transition and providing a more liberal interpretation of Islam has not really gotten the currency that it deserves. But I think these are healthy debates. I mean, I haven't been to Egypt recently, but you know, now that Mubarak is gone, there is at least a public sphere where people can sort of, you know, um, breathe and can sort of have an exposure to different ideas. Um, and so I think that fundamentally is a healthy thing in terms of the, the future political transformation of, of, of the Arab world. Okay, I think we have one more question here. Yeah, no. I was curious what what the tribal leaders regarding Libya or Syria, is the, do the tribes, are they supportive of the move for democracy as far as democracy, or is it more tribal? Yeah, it depends on what society you're looking at. I mean, Libya is a much more tribal society than Syria is. But one of the big problems in the case of Libyan tribes is now that the old dictator has fallen and there's a democratic process taking place and there's a parliament, there is deep fears of um, of, uh, of being left out of the political pie, of lack of representation. There's regional divisions in Libya, there's also tribal divisions. One of the challenges in terms of bringing these groups into the political process and, and so-called moderating them is to give them a stake in the future of the country, making sure that all of the big tribal groups have constituencies that can, pro that can play the, the spoiler roles in terms of uh, that they're represented, that they feel included. I think my reading of what's happening in Libya is they feel much the, the leaders of the Libyan Democratic Transition, the, the Libyan Transition Council, have done a fairly good job in terms of reaching out to these groups. I think that's part of the challenge of, 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 of dealing with the dangers of breakaway tribal groups, and, and, and which can then lead to the decay and the disruption of the democratic transition. Syria is less of a tribal society. It's a, it's a very mod, fairly modern society. As you go into the rural areas, it's, it's more traditional. But um, the big problem in Syria with respect to the future of the country is less tribal, but it's more sectarian.
Um, how do you deal with the fact that about 10 to 12 percent of the population is an Alawite Shia majority that is perceived by the Sunni majority and perceived by many of the rebels as being complicit with the policies of the regime? How do you deal with the very genuine fears that in the aftermath of the fall of Assad, you could have these sectarian massacres that could take place? Um, how do you deal with the fact that in Syria you also have a 10 percent Christian minority that's very fearful of what might come in the future, and that's why um, they have, you know, they, they've been very, very, I think, worried, legitimately so, about the future. So I think those are the more, uh, the more pressing challenges in Syria. It's more of a sectarian minority challenge than a tribal one. Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. It was, it was a really great talk. And please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Hashim.